Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. This is Bishop Mel. We're now in a portion where we can share with you once more the Holy Word of God. title of the message tonight is, Live Holy and Please God. Live Holy and Please God. Our text tonight came from the book of First Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 1. Let me just open up in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your sustaining power upon our lives, upon this prayer line ministry, God. We give you praise. We give you glory, O oh God, that we can come together once more in one spirit. Lord, O oh God, to praise you, worship you, O oh God, with all our heart, body, and soul, God. We give you praise tonight, O oh God, for those who will be coming and have an answer to their prayer request, God. Lord, oh God, thank you, Lord, for the, uh, for the word that you have impressed upon my heart tonight, oh God. I pray that it will hit its mark, oh God. Lord, to those who are listening, oh God, even the silent listener. So tonight, I just want to give you all the glory, the praises, and the honor in Jesus, in Jesus' precious holy name. The title of the message again tonight is, Live Holy and Please God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, it says here, We instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. You know, John and Joan Wilson are devout Christians who have been serving the Lord since they were children. Richard and Barbara Smith recently moved in next door to the to the Wilson. They are not Christian and they don't pretend of being so. But they develop a friendship with the Wilson. So Richard and Barbara Smith started attending church with John and Joan. Then Richard suddenly stopped attending. So John and Joan visited him to find out why he had stopped attending church. So Richard told him that although his wife Barbara seemed to be making some progress in her spiritual life, Richard just could not seem to get it together with any consistency at all. He felt like a hypocrite because he still indulged in some of his old habit of drinking and smoking. One thing he did not want to be was a hypocrite. So he stopped going to church. Now, how would you counsel Richard? In today's message or lesson, we will be reviewing qualities of Christian living. We will be taking time to evaluate our commitment to live in a way that is pleasing to whom? To God. Adversity. Who wants it? Nobody, I believe. But who who experiences it? Everybody experiences adversity. Trouble comes at different times in a variety of ways to all people. Most people avoid it like the black plague, but it still seems to find them. Yet through every situation, no matter how difficult people can still difficulties, people can still live a life that pleases. God. But how? Tonight message, you will observe that Christians are called by God to live holy and please Him. You may as well face the truth. Serving the Lord Jesus Christ in a fallen and sin-filled world is never an easy task. It is not right to give people the idea that it is. In fact, you know, being a Christian can expose you to a whole new set of difficulties you never experienced before. But the good news is that as a Christian, you have divine resources to help you live a life that is pleasing to God. Through faith in God, it is possible to live holy and please God. If you want to go, let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. Okay, verses 3 to 8. You know, the Thessalonian Christians were no strangers to trouble. Their church was birthed in the middle of persecution. That's why Apostle Paul was quite concerned to see how they were doing during his absence. So they were relatively young converts and had not fully proven themselves Yet, and yet Apostle Paul was worried that they would be moved or unsettled 
by the affliction they were experiencing. That's why here in verse 3 it says, So that no one would be unsettled by these trials, you know quite well that we were destined for them. They know that they will go to some trouble or trials. So everyone reacts differently to trials. Some people get upset and angry because of a prolonged trials or testing, taking out on God, blaming God or everybody else. Others become very unsettled, even unreliable. But still others allow God to use their trials as a means to spiritual growth and maturity. So this, of course, is the best response, if you notice. But it is not always the easiest. But the Christian in Thessalonica, one of the reasons they cope with their affliction so very well was Paul had warned them ahead of time that they would suffer hardship in verse 4. Just open your Bible for the sake of time. So Paul was straightforward with them from the very start. You do not want to mislead people into thinking that being a Christian is trouble free. No way. Hallelujah. You will have, you will have tribulation even if you're a Christian no matter what. Because that was the Lord said. In the world, in this world, you will have tribulation. But he gave us uh, uh, encouragement. He said, be encouraged. Be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. So, Christian is not a trouble-free Christian. You still have to go tribulation. Another reason the believer in Thessalonica coped so well with trial was they stood firmly on their faith in God. They have faith in God. They stand firmly, stood firmly. They're steadfast. Feel, uh, that's why it is solid commitment to take God as His Word and then stand on the Word no matter what the circumstances might be. They stand firmly with faith. Apparently, the, the, the Thessalonican, they had learned uh, this lesson and applied it in their lives. Wow. So by faith, by faith you can stand steadfast in the face of life's greatest adversity because your faith is not dependent on your feeling, not dependent on your circumstances or the opinions or treatment of others. Genuine faith rests firmly. Listen to this on the counsel of God's word. This is the common denominator of the heroes of faith in the book of Hebrews. Because of faith, they survive. The heroes of faith. This can be the common denominator for you and me as well as you learn to live by faith. You know them, those who live by faith in the Bible. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Moses, you know their story. Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel, you know their story. By faith, they stand by faith. Paul was greatly encouraged by the good news. Here, Timothy brought back from Thessalonica in verse 5 and 7. It says, if for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. This is uh, Paul talking to Timothy. I was afraid that in some way, the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. So here we could see even Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. So Timothy has a good news about faith, firmly standing in faith. So Paul was greatly encouraged. It made his own affliction more bearable. He did not think only himself, but of them as well. Paul was comported by their faith. So this shows why it is so helpful not to become self-pity when facing adversity. If you focus exclusively on your own misery, you will never see the, victor the victories that other people experience during adversity in trials like Enoch, like Noah, like Moses, and all those heroes of faith. Go to the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians again, chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. The concept of holiness is negative for many people, even this day. Certainly, there are many things that 
people are to avoid or abstain from in their achieving holiness. But there are also many things that holiness encourages encourages them to do. You know, holiness is not an elective or option in Christianity. It is required. It is a must. Holiness is a large part of living to please God. Without holiness, you cannot please God. The word holy in its related words, holiness and holiest are found over 600 times in the Bible. If you are a student of the Bible, you know this. It is one of the vital things a Christian must have to please God. So the people to whom Paul wrote live in an ungodly culture in Thessalonica. It was rampant with idolatry, sexual promiscuity, and gross immorality. This was the foundation in which the new believers at Thessalonica were trying to keep up with their spiritual lives. That's why no wonder Apostle Paul plays such an emphasis on holiness in his letter. It says here, verse 1 of chapter 4, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. That's the advice of Apostle Paul. So here we could see that because the Apostle wrote, about sexual sin here, verses 1 and 2, it is safe to conclude that it was an obstacle for some believers in Thessalonica. That's why Paul made it clear sexual purity was a definite part of God's will for the believers in Thessalonica. So Apostle Paul's solemn word to the Thessalonian believers were intended to instruct, to correct, and warn them to flee from sexual immorality. Christians of all ages are to live lives with, that leads to what? To morality. Sexual purity is a large part of personal holiness. That's why verse 7 of chapter 4, it says, For God did not call us to be impure pure, but to live a holy life. When God called us, we are to live a holy life. That's what it says in verse 7. Going back to verse 4, it's open to various interpretation. It says here that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Some see it as a reference to what? To keep keeping ourselves free from sexual immorality. But others see it as keeping one's relationship with one's spouse free of sexual defilement. That's why our text tonight seems to favor the view the word vessel could refer to a person or a spouse. So there is also a serious warning here given to those who would take advantage of another through sex, sexual misconduct. Why? It says here in, that in, the, in this matter, verse 6, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sin, as we have already told you and warned you. So there's a judgment coming to them who behave, uh, uh, who had a misconduct, sexual misconduct, and were sick. That's why whenever people engage in sexual sin, others are taken advantage of. That's why sexual sin goes beyond the boundaries of purity and holiness. It will hinder you to please God. God has called you to holiness. As I said in verse 7, He called you to holiness. Whenever God takes something bad from your life, He replaces it with something good. He will replace the guilt, the shame of sexual sin with the pleasure of intimacy as He intended it to be experienced in the boundaries of marriage relationship. So to those who are unmarried, if you're listening, He will give self-control. He gives His Holy Spirit to all believers so they can follow His command 
to live a holy life. Love is the foundation. If you want to go verses 9 to 12 of the same chapter 4, love is the foundation of all Christian ethic. Love was something the Thessalonian Christian were known for. For such a young church, they excelled in this virtue. Believers are not only asked to act with love, but also to what? To be accountable and responsible. The fourth exhortation given in verse 1 of chapter 4 is that you lead a quiet life. Okay? That does not mean taking a bow of silence to never speak again. No! It means that you do not live unsettled life. If you are always frustrated, always depressed with where you're with where your time and money have gone. You don't know. You are not living a quiet life. Living a quiet life can be thought of as living a fixed life or focused life. You know, you are also to mind, listen to this, mind your own business. All people to some extent have a tendency to be nosy. But with some people, it is an unholy, unholy love to satisfy their carnal curiosity. It has nothing to do with praying for, for other people's need or showing compassion. This unwholesome concern often leads to other sin. Like what? Like, like gossiping. If you, mind other, uh, if you don't mind your own business, it leads to gossiping, maligning others, or abusing or slandering the character of another. So this causes strife and division in churches. You need to be careful not to meddle in other people's business. The last inju injunction is to work and earn a living. Christians are not to have or feel that the world owes them a living. God expects people to work or labor to provide for themselves and their families. You can find that in verse 12. Christians are to be the best and hardest working, working people in the workplace, even in the, world, in the whole world. Their effort at work must reflect their commitment to Christ. They must see Jesus in them. Verse 12 also states that two things that are the result of the following, following the admonition given in verse 11. Your life will be powerful way to witness to the lost as we live a holy that will please God. Hallelujah. You know, ha, praise the Lord. Living to please God is a lifelong, long, lifelong challenges and it is more of a journey than a destination. That's right. Throughout this journey, you will encounter various challenges to live holy. You will experience troubles that may seem insurmountable. You will battle temptation also to compromise and give in to the low moral standards of our culture. But you can maintain your purity, listen to this, by pursuing holiness moment by moment. How? Through faith in God. You can overcome the troubles and trials of life in your quest to please God, you will learn that His will impacts every area of your life. From building loving relationship with God and with others, living to please God is the most challenging lifestyle that you will ever have, but it is also the most rewarding. Both in this life and throughout eternity, you can have the confidence that you are doing what what you were created to do when you live to please God. That's why living to please God in our day and culture can really be challenging. We will definitely be tested in our, commu in our commitment to live a holy life that is pleasing to the Father. You know, we will pass through trials from without and even temptation from within. The enemy of our faith will always be trying to find something to hinder our holy life. That's temptation from within. And you will go through trials upon trials from without. We may even stumble at times and fall short of God's call to holiness for our lives. That's why the cru crucial Lesson for us to learn tonight and practice is that through faith, 
Remember faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So through faith, we can consistently live a life of obedience to the Lord. And it takes a lifelong pledge on our part in total dependence. Where? Who? On the Holy Spirit. That's why in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will have the power and to make us the people of God want us to be. Let us be in constant prayer daily, non-stop, seeking Him, seeking the face of God. That God will give us the faith, give us the faith to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Faith to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Christians need to let their lives burn brightly for God. When the way we live agrees with the words we speak, we make a powerful impact for Christ. Let's seek to please God even when faced with life's adversity in Jesus, in Jesus' precious holy name. Let me just close up in prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, we pra- we praise you, God, tonight. Your, your standard is holiness. Without it, no man shall see the Lord. So thank you, Father, tonight for your righteousness which enable us to walk in holiness before you. So therefore, by your mercy, we We now present, Lord, we present our body, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to you, which is our reasonable service. So, Lord, give unto you, we, we will give unto you the glory that is due your name. We would come before you and worship you in the beauty of your holiness. And even we repent of our sin and ask you to bring us into holiness without which we cannot see you. We desire to be holy as you are holy, Lord. Impart your holiness to us so that we might be pure in heart, capable of seeing you as you are in all your holiness, honor, power, and majesty. Let us serve you with pureness of our heart tonight, God. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Son of God with power according to the spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, you, Lord, have given us the grace to be holy. You are renewing us, Lord, in the spirit of mind. Because of this, we are able to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and through holiness. So from this point on, we will continue in faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please you and continue in love in holiness. Thank you, Father, for your chastening that make it possible for us to partake of your holiness. So help us now to realize that we learn obedience through your correction, God. You, Lord, are holy. You set upon your throne high and lifted up, and your train fills the temple. We join with the angels who cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with your glory. So help us now to see you in all your holiness, Lord, and in so and in, in, in by being, seeing you in holiness, to desire to be holy also as you are holy in this life until we reach heaven and glorify you before your holy throne of grace and mercy in Jesus, in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Hallelujah.